Hello everyone. There won't be a B-roll intro with music in the background today. This video is intended to be a follow-up to the previous QBZ191 video that I made last year. So if you haven't watched that one, I highly recommend that you do so because it will provide a lot of important contexts. Since that video was uploaded, I was able to find a lot more info about the QBZ191, which rendered some of the things that I said in that previous video outdated or flat out incorrect. Of course, Due to the limited amount of information available to me back then, I did not expect everything I say in that video to be true, and I tried to make that clear during my presentation. But I still regret that there were major pieces of false information in that video, which I presented as if they were facts, even though there wasn't enough evidence for me to conclude as such. So for that, I apologize, and this video will be my attempt to rectify those mistakes and present some additional findings that I've discovered since then. Also, to avoid making the same mistakes as before, I will repeat a lot of disclaimers and be very conservative in my analysis, so sorry in advance if it gets tedious. Now, I will begin by going over the structure of this video, since it's a bit different from my previous ones. Normally, I like to go from one component of the gun to another, presenting everything I know about each component at once, but this time I was able to infer info about many components from a small number of patent documents. So for this video, I'll go from one patent document to another, talking about multiple components at a time, so that you know where the information came from, and can determine for yourself if it is trustworthy. And of course, the usual caveat applies, being that I do not speak Chinese, so most information will be derived from pictures, Google Translate was used for texts, and I will put all my sources in the description so that you can check them out for yourself. Okay. But before I present these juicy patent drawings, I will first correct the minor mistakes from my previous video and present some minor additional details. First up are the designations. The rifle variant is designated QBZ191, obviously. The carbine is called QBZ192. And the DMR is called QBU191. Like the previous video, I will just use QBZ191 when I'm talking about a mechanism that is the same in all variants and I will tell you when I'm just referring to a single variant. Speaking of different variants, here's a comparison of the muzzle devices on the rifle, carbine, and DMR. The rifle and carbine have similar flash hiders, but the rifle has this spring here to retain a rifle grenade. The DMR has this weird looking muzzle device with no vents. Here's a more close-up photo of the bolt release. It kind of looks like this rectangular section here is not integral to the aluminum lower receiver. Maybe it is a steel insert. From this screenshot, we can also see the piece that directly catches the bolt, which is this plunger here. It looks like it's the same design as the bolt catch on the QBZ95-1, so it has some differences compared to an AR-15. As for the magazine release, what I presented in the previous video was correct, but I just thought that this video showing the magazine release in action is kinda neat. Unlike with the magazine release, I said something wrong about one of the magazines in the previous video, this one specifically. I said that it holds 25 rounds, because the marking at the back only goes to 25. But if I overlay this magazine on another magazine, which we know holds 30 rounds, you can see that they are the same size. Before, I thought that it cannot hold 30 rounds, because I assumed that the bottom round is supposed to align with the numbers, and if the 25th round is here, then the space beneath would be for the spring and the follower. But how it probably works is that the bottom of the follower is supposed to align with the numbers, not the bottom round. So yeah, this is a 30 round magazine. Next is the QMK optical sight. In the previous video, the screenshot that I used shows that the variant with Picatinny mount for the 191 is designated QMK152. But last year at Chuhai Air Show 2021, these optics are designated QMK171A, so the designation was probably updated. There's also this website of a Chinese manufacturer, which shows an optic that is very similar to the QMK. Even though the scope body looks to be a different shape, all of the features and controls seems to be the same. The reticle is also the same. Again, the eye box looks pretty generous. So if we make the assumption that these optics are basically the same, just in different shells, then we can determine some specs for the QMK. The scope can be passively illuminated by tritium for aiming in low light, in addition to the fiber optic light gathering unit that I mentioned in the previous video. 
the turret adjustment is 0.25 mils or 0.86 MOA per click, similar to the YMA series for the QBZ95 family. The total amount of adjustment is 30 mils or 103 MOA. Here are a few more specs for the people who know more about optics than I do, which is a pretty low bar. Now let's go to the DMR optic. In all of the photos I could find, there are no designation markings anywhere, so we still don't know what this one is called. However, I was able to find a photo of the reticle, but it's quite blurry. Interestingly, there are Dragunov style stadiometric ranging marks here. A mistake that I made in the previous video is that I thought this turret was for brightness adjustments. Now that we have better photos, it seems that the brightness adjustments is here, as indicated by the markings and the battery cap. This turret is probably for parallax adjustments, again based on the markings. You can see the infinity symbol here. Okay, now I'm treading on territory where I don't have deep knowledge about. Because the parallax turret is on the objective bell, and because the reticle has stadiometric ranging marks, I believe this is the first focal plane optic. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There are also other information that can be seen on the scope markings. The elevation and windage adjustment seems to be 0.1 mils, or 0.34 MOA per click, much finer than the QMK series. The lowest magnification of the scope seems to be 3, and the highest, maybe 7. The final optic is the IR5118. In this photo, you can see it on a proprietary QD mount for the QBZ95, but the scope itself looks like the same one on the QBZ191. This is an electronic scope with 9 hours of battery life, thermal capability, and Wi-Fi transmission. Interesting. I don't have any footage of what it's like to use this site, but I imagine that it would be similar to this other Chinese product from a private company that I'm not going to try to pronounce. This is the Mars 2.0 which also has thermal imaging capability, and it can wirelessly transfer the sight picture to a helmet-mounted display. Again, I couldn't find any detailed specification for these optics. Next up is the cleaning kit. In this photo, you can see a trap drawer underneath the pistol grip, held in place by a knurled button, similar to the QBZ95-1. In this poster, you can see what looks like a cleaning kit here. I would guess that the QBZ191 cleaning kit is similar to that of the QBZ95, not the QBZ95-1. This is because the QBZ95-1 has a long cleaning rod stored inside the receiver. In this poster, we can't see anything that looks like a long cleaning rod, so I think that the QBZ191 cleaning rod has multiple sections stored in the cleaning kit, like the QBZ95. On the same poster, photographed from another angle, we can see a round counter. This is not a counter for how many rounds are currently in the gun, but for how many rounds has gone through the gun. It serves the same function as an odometer in a car, which is to schedule maintenance. At least that's what I read on the English source where I found this photo. Finally, the vertical foregrip, specifically this model. In the last video, I guessed that one of these things at the front is a camera, because I can't read the Chinese text on the controls, and I thought that those buttons are way too complicated for just lights and lasers, but it turns out that they are indeed just lights and lasers, with three different colors for the light. Someone on Chinese social media called me cute for making that mistake, which made me blush a little. Okay, now the patent drawings. I will have to put a disclaimer here. These are just patent drawings, not production drawings. So there are no guarantees that these mechanisms are applied to physical rifles exactly how they are drawn, or at all. Unless I show you real photos that depicts these mechanisms, their existence is only implied, not certain. With that out of the way, let's start with the simplest one, the front sight. This pattern is for the front sight folding mechanism. First, there's a detent here to keep the tension on the front sight in both the folded and unfolded positions. In addition, the pivot on the front side tower has a spring-loaded pin with a finger that locks the front side tower in place. You unlock the front sight by pushing in this pin, which will remove the finger from the locking hole. You can see in actual photos that the front sight is locked when folded and also unfolded. The patent states that both positions should be locked to prevent the front sight from either flipping open under recoil and obstructing the optic, or folding down when you need to use it. 
Also, while this is not mentioned in the documents, we can infer from these drawings that the front sight is only adjustable for elevation by screwing or unscrewing the front sight post. While we're at the front sight, let's talk about the rear sight as well, even though I have no patent drawings for it. I have mentioned in my previous video that the QBZ191 rear sight works similarly to that of the QBU88. This video, I want to add a few other details. The QBZ191 rear sight is adjustable for windage, and the adjustment mechanism is similar to the QBZ95-1, where you use a flathead screwdriver to rotate the screw here. As for range adjustments, this is quite interesting. The Springfield Hellion was released recently in the US market, and the ranging mechanism in its rear sight is pretty much the same as the QBZ191 and the QBU88, even down to the detail that the range markings are shown in a hole underneath the aperture. So Croatia just pulled a reverse UNO card and copied the Chinese. But jokes aside, this just goes to show that we've reached a plateau in small arms design, and there are only so many efficient ways that you can accomplish a certain function. Anyways, range adjustments is made by rotating this disc with multiple apertures. Each aperture is a different distance from the center, so that's how you change the elevation. Also, unlike the QBU88 and the QBZ95 family, the QBZ191 seems to have no glowing night sights. To me, this implies that the iron sights have been relegated to a backup role in PLA doctrine and they will be using the QMK optic on a large scale, which has tritium for low-light aiming. The next pattern is for the handguard retaining mechanism. In the previous video, I inferred that the polymer handguards for the rifle and carbine have a metal sleeve nested inside the front end, which dovetails into the gas block to secure the handguard to the gun. This turned out to be mostly correct. The metal sleeve is depicted in this diagram, and you can see the folding front side here. The two threaded holes on each side, as well as the one on the bottom, also match what can be seen in actual photos. This diagram from the previous front sight pattern shows the profile of the dovetail, just as I expected. What I got wrong was the retaining mechanism. I thought it was a pin, but actually it's a captive screw that tightly clamps the sleeve on the gas block dovetail. Here's the slot on the screw head for a flathead screwdriver. This is the cutaway diagram of the screw mechanism, viewed from the top. This is a screw with the threaded portion limited to only this end. It has an elastic washer here to prevent the screw from backing out. This plunger would prevent you from pulling the screw out of the handguard sleeve entirely. To completely remove the screw, align this through hole on the screw with the plunger, insert a punch to push the plunger back slightly, so that another punch can be inserted into this hole, which locks the plunger in the compressed position, then you can take the screw out. Of course, this would likely be done only in the armory, not in the field. In fact, I'd say that the screw should never be unscrewed in the field at all, because the handguard probably doesn't need to be removed for basic field strip. While we're at the handguard, let's talk about the QBU191 DMR. In this clip, you can kinda see that there's no connection between the handguard and the barrel anywhere, except the 12 o'clock position, which we cannot clearly see. However, if we look at the side of the DMR handguard, we don't see the captive screw that is present on the rifle and carbine. If we look at the connection between the DMR handguard and the barrel nut, we can also see that it's very rigid, and very similar to how free-floated AR-15 handguards are mounted. So I am 99% sure that the QBU191 handguard is free-floated. Next up is the gas system. In my previous video, I mentioned that there are two variations. One is the prototype, which is short and likely only has one gas chamber like most other gas blocks out there. The other one, which is likely used in current production guns, has two gas chambers. Recently, I discovered that the dual chamber design itself has two patterns, one with a single gas port and one with two gas ports. The one I showed in the previous video is the single port variant. Let's go over it again, this time in more detail. This is the regulator. You can see that it has a secondary chamber here and a main chamber that powers the piston. In this design, gas first enters through the port in the barrel, then expands in the secondary chamber. This expansion allows the pressure and temperature of the gas to drop. After that, the gas travels through this slot underneath the regulator into the regulator port, then enters the main chamber, where it acts on the piston and cycles the gun. The purpose of reducing the gas pressure and temperature in this chamber 
is so that the erosion of this regulator port happens at a slower rate, increasing the life of the regulator over long-term use. This is important for reliability, because if the regulator port is too large, an excessive amount of gas will push on the piston, which will cycle the gun much faster and more violently than necessary. This can lead to problems like reduced parts life and the magazine spring not being able to keep up with the bolt carrier group velocity. This is exactly what was mentioned in the patent documents, and it's the reason why the Chinese wanted to implement the dual chamber gas block. They also mentioned that this is especially more important in short barreled rifles. Remember that the QBZ191 rifle and 192 carbine have relatively short barrels, somewhere in the ballpark of the standard M4 and the Mark 18. The shorter barrel and shorter gas system mean that the gas port pressure is higher, and any overgassing problem will be magnified. Also note that the gas regulator has two ports, one for normal use and one for adverse conditions. You can select between these two settings by lifting up this loop here, not pushing it forward like I said in the previous video. After that, you can turn the regulator. This will align one of the two gas ports with this slot here, which is connected to the secondary chamber and the barrel gas port. If you turn it to this middle position, you can completely cut off the gas to launch rifle grenades. Now let's look at the dual port variant. The only difference between this and the single port is that there are two gas ports in the barrel. The smaller port at the back is perpendicular, and the larger port in the front is oblique. In this design, as the bullet passes the rear port, gas first enters that port and expands into both the secondary and main chamber. Of course, this expansion also reduces the pressure and temperature, similar to the first design. This initial amount of gas provides a slow start to the piston, but it's probably not enough to fully cycle the gun. As the bullet passes the second port, an additional amount of gas goes through that port, enters the secondary chamber, expands, pressures and temperatures are reduced, then it goes into the regulator port to provide the rest of the energy needed to fully cycle the gun. The patent stated that this design will provide a larger volume of gas to the gun in case the pressure of the ammunition is too low, while still keeping the pressure and temperature at the regulator port low enough to prevent excessive erosion with standard pressure ammunition. So the final question is, which design is present on the actual guns? If we look at these drawings, we can see that the ports on the gas blocks are drilled from the top down. So the dual port design has two holes on top, and the single port only has one hole. So far, I have only been able to find images of the gas blocks with one hole on top, so I would assume that only the single port design was adopted. A final note about the gas block is that it seems like the DMR uses a different gas block design, which probably only has one gas chamber. You can see in these photos that the gas block protrudes out way less on the DMR, and it's not because the DMR gas block is recessed further inside the handguard, because you can still see this step here, which you can also see at the same position on the rifle. Of course, these photos are not conclusive enough, but it would make sense that the DMR doesn't need a dual chamber gas block, because its longer barrel means that the gas port is further away from the chamber, so the port pressure is lower. The next pattern will be the improved firing pin retaining pin. As described in the document, the context behind this design is that traditional AR-15 cotter pins can be easily broken or lose elasticity over time. If this happens, you run the risk of losing the cotter pin when you take the bolt carrier group out of the upper. However, the benefit of the AR-15 style firing pin design was also stated. In AR-15s, the firing pin travels with the bolt carrier, so if the gun slam fires, it would do so when the bolt carrier has reached the frontmost position meaning when the bull has locked. Conversely, on AKs, or on their previous service rifles, the QBZ-95, the firing pin travels with the bolt, so there's a risk that the gun will slam fire as soon as the bolt hits the barrel, before it is locked. The roll pin that retains the firing pin on the QBZ-95 is also harder to remove for maintenance, and if you remove and reinstall it multiple times, it can also lose elasticity and work itself out of the bolt during use, causing a serious malfunction. Based on these reasonings, the Chinese wanted to go with the AR-15 style firing pin, but with a better retaining pin design. Unlike the AR-15 cotter pin that goes through the bolt carrier from left to right, this new firing pin retaining pin goes from top to bottom. 
It has a tap at one end with a hole in it. A spring-loaded plunger locks into this hole, which prevents the tap from rotating out of the slot in the bolt carrier. To remove the firing pin retaining pin, you need to use a punch to depress this plunger, then rotate the tap out of the slot, after which you can pull the firing pin retaining pin out. There is another pin that keeps the plunger in place, so that it would not just shoot out of the bolt carrier when you remove the firing pin retaining pin. Personally, I feel that this design is a bit over-engineered, and when you remove the firing pin retaining pin, it's still a tiny component that can be lost in the field. However, the fact that you need to use a tool to remove it makes me suspect that they don't expect soldiers to remove the firing pin during field strips at all, and that means the bolt wouldn't be removed either. Then again, this is just a patent drawing, we can't be sure if this mechanism is actually implemented until we see a photo. There is also some other information that can be inferred from this patent. First, you can see what looks like a slot in the bolt and the bolt carrier here. This, combined with what I said in the last video, supports the hypothesis that the ejector is fixed. Also from these drawing views, I guess that there would be a groove like this running on both sides of the bolt carrier, and the bolt carrier would be supported inside the upper receiver like this. The other, much more interesting piece of info that can be derived from this patent is this. It looks like there is a lever here, with one end protruding up from the tombstone of the bolt carrier, and the other end locking the camp in. If you watch my QBZ95 video, I mentioned that the AR-15 bolt carrier group design has a weakness, being the lack of an anti-pre-engagement mechanism. In short, the geometry of the cam groove constantly tries to close the bolt as the bolt carrier group travels forward. What stops the bolt from closing prematurely is the left side of the cam track in the upper receiver, constantly supporting the cam pin during travel. But this generates a lot of friction. It affects the longevity of the upper receiver as well, since the receiver is aluminum and the cam pin is steel. So on the QBZ191, this lever locks the cam pin in place, preventing it from grinding on the cam track. As the bolt enters the barrel extension, this piece on the QBZ upper pushes down on the lever which unlocks the cam pin, allowing the bolt to be closed. Also, I have to put a disclaimer here. This animation is made by a Twitter user, it's not official. The creator themselves also captioned it as just a concept. I showed this because it clearly demonstrates the cam pin locking mechanism, but do not derive any other information from this animation, as I don't know if they are correct, and the parts geometry is vastly simplified. The fire control group is correct though which I will talk about later. Additionally, I am fairly certain that the campion locking mechanism is implemented in the actual rifles, because first, in this photo, you can see the pin for the locking lever on the bolt carrier's tombstone. You can also see these two pins here, which hold this piece of metal in place, as shown in this CAD diagram of the prototype rifle. Anyways, an interesting point is that the Beretta ARX-160 also has a campion locking mechanism but it's only similar in concept and not in execution. However, the inclusion of this mechanism in the ARX-160 is somewhat of a necessity, because it has a polymer receiver and ejection ports on both sides, so there's not enough support for the cam pin. On the other hand, the Chinese totally could have left the AR-15 cam pin design alone, but they went the extra kilometer to improve it, which is pretty cool. Speaking of improvements, if you look at the cam track on the QBZ191 bolt carrier, you can see that this portion is elongated. This is similar to the G36 or the LMT enhanced AR15 bolt carriers. This elongated cam track keeps the bolt locked for longer, allowing the chamber pressure to drop some more before unlocking. Again, this is especially important in short barreled rifles, as the port pressure is higher, leading to a higher bolt carrier velocity. Another thing is that, in traditional DI guns, the long gas tube that the gas must travel down before it reaches the bolt carrier provides time and space for the gas to reduce its pressure and slowly initiate the motion of the bolt carrier. This is why DI guns are smoother shooting than piston guns. On piston guns, the hot and spicy gases, fresh out of the gas port, smacks the piston back violently, and that violence is transmitted to the bolt carrier. The QBZ191, with its higher port pressure, and a piston operating mechanism means that the longer cam slot is a design decision that is very appropriate to the specific operating condition. As you can see, the Chinese implemented every possible enhancement to the AR-15 bolt carrier. Well, what about the bolt? 
This is a patent of an improved extractor spring layout for the bolt. The context for this design, as stated in the document, is that in a traditional AR-15 bolt, the single extractor spring placed perpendicular to the bolt has a few disadvantages. First, its length is limited by the fact that there is a firing pin channel right beneath. As the extractor spring can only be so long, there is a limit to the force that it can generate. Second, the orientation of this extractor spring only puts tension on the extractor in the radial direction, and as such, it only removes slop in that direction. This means that the extractor is still allowed to slide back and forth along the length of the bolt a minuscule amount due to the tolerances between parts. This can lead to inconsistent ejection. However, the patent also recognizes the benefit of an AR extractor design in that it allows the bolt head to be very small in diameter leading to a more compact weapon, as opposed to AK extractors that require a large bolt head. To improve on the deficiencies of the AR-15 extractor spring, the Chinese decided to use this layout. First, two springs, more force, pretty straightforward. The fact that the holes for the extractor spring doesn't interfere with the firing pin channel also means that the springs can be longer. Additionally, the oblique orientation of the extractor springs puts forces on the extractor in both the radial and axial direction, effectively eliminating all slop, leading to more consistent ejection. Another detail that we can see in this diagram is the extractor pin. It looks like it has this tap at one end. If you look at this diagram, it seems like the tap on the pin is situated underneath this protrusion on the bolt carrier. This is likely so that when the bolt carrier group is assembled, the extractor pin is retained by this protrusion, so that it cannot walk out of the bolt. If that's true, then it's another very well thought out incremental design improvement to the AR-15 system. Another thing that can be seen in this patent drawing is the four-lug bolt head. The lengths of the locking lugs are not uniform, for some unknown reason. Unlike traditional AR bolt heads, where the extractor stands in place of one locking lug, on the QBZ, the extractor sits between two locking lugs so the bolt face should be more evenly supported. This photo came up while I was editing this video, where you can see the bolt face and the slot for the fixed ejector. So the bolt geometry with four locking locks and the fixed ejector are confirmed. However, I don't think we can be sure that the dual oblique extractor spring were implemented, unless we see a photo of those. The final patterns that I have today are those of the fire control group. This is the part where I made the biggest mistake in the last video. I presented this image and said that it's a fire control group for the QBZ191. At that point, this image was the only piece of information I obtained about the 191 trigger pack, and it is a screenshot of a screenshot. I did not have access to the full patent document. For this video, I was able to locate full documents for every patent that I found, which provided a lot more information. So this fire control group is indeed a two-stage AR-15 style trigger pack like I said in the previous video. And this mystery piece is probably a takedown lever that allows you to remove the fire selector and then the whole trigger unit. But the mistake that I made was that this trigger pack is likely for the prototype QBZ191 only, not the current production one. If I pull up this CAT diagram of the prototype, you can see that it's the same AR-15 style fire control group. The bottom of the trigger pack in this diagram is noticeably lower than the bottom of the magwell. This feature is also true in this photo of a prototype 191. However, on the current production gun, the bottom of the trigger pack is in line with the bottom of the magwell. I actually noticed this when I made the previous video, but for some reason, I didn't think much of it. Now, when we look at this screenshot of a current production gun, there's no AR-15 style auto sear. Recently, I was able to obtain this patent, and it looks like everything checks out. First, there's no AR-15 style auto sear. The takedown lever is also at the same place, and the fire selector shaft is visible between this triaded pad and this raised portion here. Another evidence is this poster, showing the trigger pack, and you can barely make out this protrusion, which is an AK style auto sear shown in the patent drawing. So this time, I am fairly confident that this is the correct fire control group used in the current production QBZ191s. It turns out to be basically an AK fire control group. The auto sear works like an AK auto sear, the hammer looks a bit different, but it functions the same way as the AK, 
by interacting with this hook on the trigger and this disconnector. The tails of the trigger and the disconnector are slightly different to interact with the AR style ambi thumb safety. Everything sits in a sheet metal trigger pack housing. Since there are so many good videos out there explaining the AK better than I ever could, I won't explain how the 191 trigger pack works because they're basically the same. Instead, I will go into detail about this takedown lever here, which is different from an AK. This lever sits on the same pin as the trigger and the disconnector. It has a spring-loaded plunger that pushes down on the trigger pack housing, thus pushing the lever up this way. This protrusion fits into one of the dimples on the left fire selector shaft to keep it on a certain fire mode. Now how do you remove the trigger pack? Before we go into this, I'll have to put out another disclaimer. This patent only describes the geometry of the left fire selector and how it interacts with the takedown lever and the trigger components. It does not show the right side fire selector at all. I extrapolated how the right selector will look and work based on the left one, and I cannot guarantee that it will be correct. So with that in mind, let's proceed. When you push the takedown lever all the way down, the protrusion on the lever exits the slot on the left fire selector shaft, and you can pull the left selector out. To remove the right selector, rotate it so that this key aligns with the cutout on the trigger pack housing, then pull it out. With both sides of the fire selector removed, you can lift the trigger pack out of the receiver as one unit. And there you go. I hope that I'm correct about the fire control group this time. That concludes my updates on the QBZ191. In my last video, I said that it has a lot of AR15 DNA. This time, I learned that it has a decent amount of AK DNA as well with the fire control group. And before people say, well, now it's just ripping off the AK, I'd like to mention that the AK style double hook trigger design first appeared in the Browning Auto 5 shotgun and was also used by a bunch of other weapons both before and after the AK, such as. And that's only the double hook trigger. The AK style auto sear appears in even more weapons. Last video, I expressed the view that despite all the similarities, I still think the QBZ191 is a result of a thorough and involved engineering process, not just blind and mindless copying. These new patents only reinforced my opinion. I said this before and I'll say it again. We have reached a plateau in small arms design and there's been no real breakthroughs in the last few decades, at least for widely adopted service weapons. These days, what makes a good firearm is the thoughtful combination of existing mechanisms, such that the end result is reliable, accurate, ergonomic, modular, and can be efficiently manufactured. After reading the patents, I'd say that the Chinese put thought into the QBZ191 alright. We can see that every design decision in the patents was made after careful evaluation of existing systems, and those decisions also make sense for their application. This is abundantly clear when you look at their bolt carrier group and gas system. They also went out of their ways to improve small deficiencies in the AR-15 design by adding a cam pin locking mechanism and replacing the flimsy cotter pin with a more robust system. Their firing pin retaining pin seems a bit over-engineered though, which is funny because I thought I'd never see the day where a comp lock weapon is over-engineered. Another thing that I noticed was that the full auto rate of fire on the 191 seems noticeably lower than that of the average AR-15. This could be due to a combination of multiple factors like the buffer, the action spring, and the stroke length of the bolt carrier group. The reduced pressure from the dual chamber gas block probably helped as well. Again, it's just an indication of a well-tuned system. There's one thing from the AR-15 that did not improve though, which is the inability to fold the stock due to the recoil mechanism being placed in a receiver extension. Okay, this is just internet hearsay and should be taken with a truckload of salt, but someone on Chinese social media said that it was because the reciprocating charging handle was a fixed requirement from higher authorities so the engineers had no choice but to put the charging handle in the gap between the upper and lower receivers and keep the long AR-15 bolt carrier to cover up that gap. If that rumor is true, then it's another classic tale of bureaucracy messing with engineering. But then again, I still maintain my opinion that the charging handle design was good compared to other side-charging ARs.
Overall, I think the QBZ191 is well designed, and being able to acquire the full patents and examine them just make me appreciate the engineering even more. That's all I have for today, thank you for watching, and again, I apologize for the misinformation I released in the previous video. I hope this one made up for it. Bye bye.